My name is Isla Rossa Owen. I'm the cultural producer for Rigton Festival Company. And I'm really thrilled to be able to welcome you today to this Writing for Performance workshop with Sky Lonerigan as part of Hooked 2021, our online festival for young readers and writers. I first wanted to say uh, thank you to all of our sponsors who have supported Hooked this year, um, which include the Hollywood Trust, the Scottish Book Trust, Kate Bailey Gifford and Creative Scotland. So let me introduce you to Sky. Sky is an award-winning writer and performer whose work spans theatre, poetry and live art. And some of you may remember she is also a former Wigtown Book Festival writer in residence. Her first solo work, Cracked, won an Edinburgh Fringe first and her more recent work, Though This Be Madness, has been reimagined online for the Scottish Mental Health and Arts Festival, examining the stigma attached to mental health. So Sky works extensively as an artist in residence with a diverse range of community groups and organizations. And through her work as artistic director for Tune Speak, Young People's Theatre and the spoken word project, Word of Mouth, Sky has extensive experience of working with young writers and performers. Today, Sky is going to be reading from and talking about her play, The Turmeric Trail, which was commissioned by Imaginate as part of their Accelerator program. Imaginate is an organization in Scotland that promotes, develops, and celebrates theater and dance for children and young people. And The Turmeric Trail is written specifically for a young adult audience. So a very warm welcome to you, Sky, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Isla. Thank you. Greetings. Greetings, Earthlings. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll just quickly run through the format. Um, Sky is going to read a couple of excerpts from the Turmeric Trail, and then she's going to run through some provocations for us as a way of inviting us to respond to those. Um, you can either work away at doing that during this session if you want to. Um, if you do so, we'd love to get some feedback from you in the comments. Um, or you can just treat them as exercises to take away with you and work on later. Um, and then towards the end of the event, we're just going to have a bit of a chat about the play and about playwriting in general. Um, and you're all very welcome to send in your questions for Sky too. So please do pop those into the chat box and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. So I'm going to hand it over to you now, Sky. Um, do you want to maybe start by introducing us to the Turmeric Trail and telling us a bit about the inspiration behind it um, and then take us through your readings. Sure, yes, okay, so the Turmeric Trail is a, is a play about a situation uh, that Berlin is in, that's the main character. And she's a young adult who's kind of coming to the end years of her, her high school, school, has exams to do if we were doing them right now would be deeply disrupted <laughs> and in her in this context her aunt who she loves dearly and has had a lot of uh close ties to growing up uh, moves in is wrestling a psychosis her aunt is and this situation puts her in a quandary about focusing on her studies trying to um pass with flying colours and set up for just past. And there's lots of stuff that come into play, the family situation, um, a love of her pet python, George, who, when we start the play, is missing. Um, and uh, she has, this is probably a crucial to know, she has in her bedroom with her an, a creature, a being, who uh, we don't know actually throughout the play. He's called Good Grief, that's the name of the character. But he, in my imagination, uh, looks a lot like a tardigrade. And I'll come to the tardigrade. I'll show you what I mean by tardigrade if you don't know already, which you probably do. But I'm very obsessed by tardigrades. And this creature, in short, arrives in her bedroom. It clearly isn't going, but doesn't say anything. Uh, is we we start it is, it's their relationship uh, that we are watching but it's it's a very spatial visual thing um so a lot of it is in the stage direction to be honest in terms of what happens between those two 
And before I read some of it, I just wanted to show you, I'm, I'm showing you a snippet from my website at the minute, uh, which will give you a picture. <laughs> yeah, it's there. So, so this is some collected images of a tardigrade, and it's in this play because it's probably the most resilient creature that I've learned about ever, and it's incredibly, you know, you can't see them. They're very tiny. We can't see them, I should say, the, the, the human eye. Um, and it, it you, you will, looking up, you'll see, you know, what they're called... Um, Oh, I've forgotten their name now. Come on. Uh, anyway, it's all there. It's all there. But the tardigrade it could survive eons of radiation, uh, dehydration. It can curl up into a little dehydrated um, form for thousands of years and then survive that and then come back to life. It has this immense propensity for resilience. <laughs> and, it, and it looks so intriguing to me. Um, <laughs> now, for some reason, that's got squished in my mind with grief. Um, but I think it's the resilience idea and the notion that in this kind of world where we realise how much more than human we are as humans even, um, the things that that are too tiny to see intrigue me, intrigue me in terms of how we're connected. And this is one of those little creatures, a bit like the microbiome in our gut, etc. that's too tiny to see. So that's just telling you where the obsession came from in terms of real life for this character called Good Grief. And then I'm going to start to read a little bit from the play, which you can see the first scene is, is called Crowded in Here. Um, uh, and after, so, this is by no means the way it would go if you were to see it on stage. It wouldn't go in this order necessarily. But I want to, I've handpicked some bits from it and then I can kind of set you a task if you're up for it. Or, or to chat a bit about it in between. Okay. Should I begin reading, Isla? Yes, I think let's just go for it. Okay, copy that. Let's just go for it. <laughs> so you'll see crowded in here is what the scene's called. Now I've put a bit of a... Uh, oh, no, you can see it. Okay, cool. So there's a Berlin's bedroom. There's a bunk bed, tiny hive-like pet homes, a glass container full of bioluminescence, a large coffin-sized empty glass tank. There's a hanging hammock or basket chair to the side somewhere outside of her room, almost off, you know, on a balcony or a porch, and there's a window somewhere. There is a puffy creature wearing several layers who looks a lot like an adult-sized tardigrade, if that were possible, and he's with her in the space. This creature is odd slowed by age and experience. His shoes are cute. He seems to be wearing shoes within shoes. They've collected so much mud, feathers and snow, charcoal and seaweed that they're stuck to his feet. He's used to walking in all terrains. He doesn't seem to be able to put his arms by his side. He's collected too much baggage along the way. He's playful but weighed down. And throughout the play, the layers of his costume come off to make uh, things that appear in the next scene. This is the trick of a, a very talented costume designer and your imagination as audience. <laughs> and, and these layers are kind of like good, good grief, uh, peeling himself off essentially. Um, and we and we learn things as we go with the things that become, the layers become different things in your imagination. Berlin says, Aunt Syl has taken the study, which is why... I'm trying to reclaim this desk. Berlin is rearranging her room to place the desk. But it's a bit crowded in here. It's a bit crowded in here. I've got my bubble, albino axolotl, my lazy scorpion, her highness, my facial bacteria experiment in algae, my little loomies. They glow when you disturb the water. My tiny tardigrade that fell from the moon, Berlin indicates the petri dish hanging around her neck, some annoying dude who just lolls about refusing to lose. Oh, excuse me. That's my, I believe that's my phone. No, that's my computer beeping my phone. Excuse me. Um, some annoying dude who just lolls about refusing to leave or take their shoes off as if it's their bedroom. Good grief is about to reply. Shh. And there's this coffin-sized fish tank where George should be. 
See, George is my pet python. I've known him since he was the size of a worm. It's not dangerous. He's such a gentle python, and he loves people. He just doesn't get out much. I'm sure he's not gone far, but the smoke might confuse him with all the fires, so best not to put your foot down. Mm, referring to her desk. No, that doesn't feel right. <gasps> She's got paint on it. She painted the study bright yellow to feel better. Auntie takes a seat in the hanging basket on the balcony outside, staring out barefoot. I call it the anti-depression chamber, but that's not what's wrong with us. It's the eyes. The eyes are different. We're all trying to suss it out. It's not the first time. <laughs> Auntie's coughing. Seeing her spit in that basket, you'd think we have drugged her. In a way, we have. I wish she could test me still. I only need 70 in each to wing it, and I've, I've written it all out. She's referring to the post-it notes on the wall. But they drop off in this heat. I, I had this horrible dream. Woke like I'd been through a washing machine. Dreamt I missed the start of chemistry. Scene, which means we're moving to the, to the next scene. I call it past, grounding the way we were. Stage directions say, good grief, takes off one of his layers, lays it out, and it becomes a patch of grass. Now, I might just stop there <laughs> and and um, offer a prompt or a, or a task, okay? So, so what intrigues me about writing for stage as opposed to anything else or, or live stuff it, are spatial relationships. Um, Berlin in this one is starting with its her her, her start line is, is um, Aunt Sil has taken the study, but then she says it's crowded in here. And what intrigues me about writing for performance is there are many different ways you could uh, play that line, but it isn't, for example, her saying it's um, it's so crowded in here that, you know, I have to squish up and my knees are up by my ears and, you know, I can't even get past this little thing, which you might do if you were writing for radio or, you know, something where the audience can't see what's going on. What intrigues me about writing for performance is there's there are so many shapes and spatial relationships to take on board when you're working out what people end up saying because they often don't say <laughs> what's actually going on anyway. Um, and, and maybe she's not showing you how crowded it is in here when she says that at all. Uh, so the provocation is something I've used when I'm teaching classical playwriting structures. But, uh, but yeah, but, but, I, but I don't have much truck with the well-made play. So if what I'm saying is I, I don't necessarily agree in, in you know, the idea of a well-made play because I think plays can take many, many different structures. But this, this exercise takes, um, especially if you're starting out with playwriting, it's really fun to do. So you just imagine a box, an empty box, as a bit of a tangent. <laughs> so I'm going off now a little bit. But if you've ever read The Little Prince, or had it read to you or or heard of it there's a lovely bit in the little prince where he the little prince is trying to say he, he wants a sheep um drawn he wants the sheep exactly how he wants the sheep to be and looks inside a box and and eventually says inside this box oh yeah that's how i want it. there's nothing in the box but we're going to pretend to peer into a, a box just now, and it's empty. This could be what, like, Peter Brook calls the empty stage, so the thing you're imagining where audience is watching what you're doing, you have nothing there, and then you just choose to place a creature or a being or a character or a person in it and an object or a thing. You, um, you describe the thing, or you just jump out what it looks like. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, where have you put the thing? Is it a tree? Is it a volcano? Is it a pencil? Is, is it a chair? Is it a, 
pond is a, a um, piece of concrete is it a concrete boulder whatever it is wherever you placed it there in relationship to the person or the thing or the creature the being you put in there you just describe it and then you shake the box <laughs> so we just do a big a big shake up and look again and what's changed there's no right or wrong jot down what it is that's changed in terms of their spatial relationship is the ball has the boulder rolled somewhere is it blown to bits are they upside down now are they in a different lighting you know is something changed with their surroundings what has changed and then sketch that out in terms of describing it as if you're trying to describe it to somebody who can't see what you're looking at that change then becomes the start of the play in the sense that something's happened and then we kick off with the play that's one way of, of starting something. You, you could also look at this um, this change as some, you know, something that happens a few times in your story, for example. So that was one task or provocation, just to simply describe what it is and describe how it's changed. It's most likely you don't end up sharing that with the audience, as in this is a thing which does that and does this and then changes to be this. But this gives you the change and might hint at that very first line or sentence or sound or state <laughs> that becomes your your opening. So that was a that was a provocation about how much I love the kind of shapes that we can make on stage and the different ways we can play the, the lines. It's crowded in here, etc. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep. Should I just keep reading, Isla? There's yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's keep going for a bit. Copy that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, this one I call past grounding the way we were. So I started by telling you that good grief takes off one of his layers. He lays it out, and it becomes a patch of grass. An auntie runs through barefoot. Berlin. What are you doing? We'll miss the start, Auntie. A patch of park, Berlin. But we'll miss it, Auntie. The grass between your toes, Berlin. Berlin. Can, can you not just do that when we come out, Auntie? You worry too much. The world will not end, Berlin. But I hate missing that. Look. I'm stopping time. Time has slowed to a stop. Now, get your socks off, barrels her over, laughing. I'll hurry up if you get your socks off, Berlin. Arrgh! Taking her shoes off. Why is it such a big deal, Auntie? Because we live with concrete between our source and soul now now come 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 they're trudging along barefoot on grass she's refusing to enjoy it at first berlin mum says there is absolutely no scientific basis for this grounding thing auntie your mum is scientifically sorting out how to put poo up people's bottoms Berlin, it's called a fecal transplant. Aunt, indeed it is. And she's doing a great job. Berlin is engrossed now in this feeling the grass between your toes thing. Good grief. Chucks a shoe. Come on. Come on. I thought you said we had to hurry, Auntie says to her. Auntie runs, grabs the shoes, throws it ahead. Berlin running after her. Oh. You are a complete whackjack, Auntie. Catch them if you can. The shoes land on concrete again. Auntie puts her shoes back on. Hmm. Do you not feel better? She nods. Then we return to desk. The stage directions say return to desk. The desk in this play is ultimately very important. But in my mind, it's like a through line and it could be a very abstract desk. So... <laughs> desk becomes a symbol and whatever it is she's returning to it you again you have no control over how that might be 
stage unless you're directing it as the writer. And it might be that there's a literal desk and a, a stage designer wants to design a desk as we know it, but there may be beautiful potentials with, you know, a desk that can become the wall and the desk becomes, or well, it does become a, an ice shelf carving too in the plate. So, yeah. So it's returning to desk is returning to her focus, her, her attempted focus in the play. I'm going to stop there and do a provocation. Great. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Provocation. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So that one I wanted to read to you because of its relationship to what people say as opposed to what they are thinking or feeling or mean and so dialogue when you're writing a, a play and you're doing you're making up the dialogue um it's in there in this play because it kind of tells you about how the how Berlin feels about her aunt um and how her aunt feels about her it also tells you that it's a kind of inkling of auntie's character and interests and passions and um, how, they, how they really like each other, obviously, and that they hang out together. So you kind of get a bit of information about their relationship in this, but they're not saying any of that to each other, obviously. So um, the, the, the provocation I want to set you is um, imagine a patch of grass and imagine you're there with someone choose someone you have a relationship to or someone you're only just meeting in this context. So a stranger who is sharing with you this thing of being a patch of grass. Um, what, what the task is is to work out what is said first <laughs> between these people and you allow them a good 30 seconds to a minute to be on that patch of grass together, what you got to sort out as the person imagining it is, yeah, you do have to choose their relationship. You have to choose, which is, well, you don't have to do anything, but it's helpful, I find, to choose where they've just come from and where they might be wanting to go to. And then often what happens is they might, you might think that somebody's, say, rushed or whatever and they're waiting for something. Maybe they're, you know, waiting for something or they've missed this bus or they've done something, you know, but very rarely would they necessarily say, oh, I've just missed a bus and it's just so stressed. So the, the task is how does this patch of grass influence what they say to each other and what do they say to each other? Um, it might be they say nothing. In which case, as a playwright, you've got to work out what instructions you're giving somebody <laughs> to do the scene. <laughs> what, what do you want out of it then if they're not saying anything? So the stage directions become all important in terms of what what spatial, what, what do you want the audience to pick up from this moment that they're sharing? And in this play, and I'll come to it at the end, but the stage directions are written in a way that they can be, um, I'll come to it at the end, but in kind of make, make of them what you will in terms of what it specifically means for that character on stage to do it. Okay, I shall, I shall read on. But I want to check in with you first, Isla. Okay. <laughs> so doing this where you can't see people in a room, so I will check in and you let me know any thoughts i will let you know if there are any comments i just actually just wanted to pick up on your point about stage directions um how flexible do you have to be as a writer to accommodate um things like stage directions and the the set um you know do you find yourself having to rewrite a lot in order to adapt things to the environment that, that the play is being staged in? That is, it's just such an interesting question because there's so many answers to that. If I'm in the position where I'm making things in the rehearsal room and, and have access to actors who are making it with me in a sense, then we can work out what they are by what offers are made. Um, and certainly in this 
process, I was really lucky. I had time in a rehearsal room with brilliant actors and Sean Hay in particular who who, who did good grief had a very hard task <laughs> you know, of, of like, okay, so I'm not saying anything the whole way except for the last scene. And, you know, so his offers as an actor were really brilliant, helpful things. Um, and I guess my answer is I end up being, I have, I undoubtedly as a writer have a really clear image in my head and I, and I endeavour to um, write my intention the best I can through the stage direction. For example, um, Berlin, we came to the description, Berlin holds the smoking gun. And that was a, I had something more specific initially as in what he was physically doing. He, um, you know, whether it was, um, not, did I say Berlin? Sorry, Good Grief holds the smoking gun. It's a stage trick. And initially it, it was, you know, Good Grief is smothering this or is doing that. And then Shilpa, who, who was um, working with me on this as, as a, an assistant director, offered up that idea, this reminder that stage directions are often the most potent when they're the most poetic in the sense that if you can offer up the, the essence of what you mean but not be prescriptive about it needs to look like the then the actor can do what they like, but they've got holes for smoking guns. So it's totally up to him <laughs> how he holds the smoking gun. And what on earth do you mean by that? Like, <laughs> you know, I, I love that about theatre. I love the fact that um, it's crowded in here as a first line. It can be uh, staged however this collective of people are imagining it. And I do find I have a very clear image of what because I write so so much with the visual in mind, I'm sure yeah. that, like, not everybody loves doing that, but I, this is why I think radio, writing for radio is completely different and um, and I think a lot of theatre gets written in a way where you could look at the floor, so <laughs> it annoys me, but anyway, that's my problem here. But, you know, <laughs> I, I do find I see what what is going on there and um, and I attempt to write that out in my intentions, but I would say that, being able to um, sort those things out with other people in space and time is a gift and it's not always what happens as a writer. You might finish up. That's why I've tried to finish up with something that is, like Shilpa was saying, if you leave it kind of a bit more <laughs> a bit more poetic in the description, then anybody can take it either way. Yeah. Whereas if I'm really fixated on it has to be this, then um, there's less freedom to take it, you know, but you still got to know your still got to say your intention on that page, or otherwise, how will they know what the scene is supposed to be if you're not saying yeah. what you meant? <laughs> so that was a really interesting question. I could probably talk for three years about that. So let's move on. <laughs> I thought before we move on, um, there is a question from the audience actually. From oh, yeah. Hello. Um, do you do a lot of planning for your characters before you start writing them, or does writing them help? To develop them, so that I'm guessing, do they develop at, in during the process of your writing? I think the voice of the character does. I think I often start with a uh, situation or a context, something emotionally that interests me about the situation or context, and the voice of the character has to has to come from there. And the only way I can describe that is I have to allow a channel. <laughs> Without sounding too magical about it, if I allow some form of space and channel for me as a writer to to let that drop in, it it will drop in, but it's it's not guaranteed. <laughs> so, so I think planning. I don't sit there and go, this character is twelve or this character is eighteen and is. But I might know their situation, like they're feeling really fraught because their aunt's just moved in and there's a lot they need to do and they love their family and their aunt, but there's, you know, clearly a lot of sadness going on about the situation that the aunt's going through and, you know, how on earth do they deal with this? Well, you know what? I think they might be moving their desk because they feel like they can't focus until they write a to-do list and move their desk. And if their desk is in the right spot, and clearly they'll be able to pass their exams. You know, so I think it comes from there and then what happens after that, I feel I often don't have a, 
immense control over in terms of what expressions come out. Great. Okay. Um, should we do another extract or do you want to go into more of the chat session? I'll, I'll, read, I'll read this one out because it fits with what you just asked because <laughs> it's Great, well, okay. where I ended up talking about a to-do list. The next line is I need a to-do list. So. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, so this one is in the present, this scene, and I've called it the tardigrade. It's the first time you hear about her obsession with the tardigrade. Which is this line clearly, you know, there you go, that's where the planning comes in. <laughs> I've got to write about a tardigrade, I know I do, but how? Um, um, so she says, uh, I need a to do list. Mum is great if you're bleeding or your bone is sticking out or you, you're giddy, giddy enough to cark it, but if you have a roof over your head and food on the table and a chance to get into uni, she is not going to listen to study woes. First world millennial problems. Auntie can always stomach study woes. Auntie would not know, she would know what to do with all, all this. Berlin is now on Skype to her boyfriend. She's Googling. She zooms in on an image of a tardigrade. Screenshot. Sends it to him on Skype. Berlin. This, this is a tardigrade. It's tiny, 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 and it is probably the most resilient creature on creature on the planet. Hey, hey, see, see, this is what it actually looks like. Skype cuts out. <gasps> she tries to call back. Skype ringtone. No answer. Oh, dodgy. Your flooded city has dodgy Wi-Fi. Calls back. Call is taken. Yeah, it, no, it somehow survived the world turning inside out and upside down, and it still looks cute, like a little bear, a little water bear. A whole bunch of these little water bears have been dropped on the moon by accident. So they're going to survive being stranded on the... Oh, poor connection. Can you hear me? Can you can you hear me? Uh, stranded on the moon to oh. calls back. It rings out. Berlin has lost the connection. He says it looks like an anus, and I can see his point, but that is not the point. The point is a tardigrade can survive without water for 30 years and survive radiation. It's been here for millennia. It's lived through water turning orange, melting. It just makes more melting. It's been fracked. It's been through ice ages and dust balls and baking and floods and earthquakes. It will probably just sleep through climate change. Oh, it's so cute. It's all marshmallow teeny Fancy hair, bit of claws, he just blobs along, mouth open, roly poly. That, that's why I bought one. She's referring to the petri dish around her neck. And then we're in another scene called the turmeric trail. Mum's possible partner says, oh, we shouldn't be near her just now. Good grief is making the turmeric trail, licking a yellow powder trail which curls on the floor. But you can't just kick family out, even if they're a python, but there are certain things that get in the way of studying, like turmeric. I've already told you about the antidepression chamber, her room, and how auntie loves yellow, but now her fingers are always staining yellow and the kitchen benches are constantly staining a blotchy yellow because she's so obsessed with turmeric. Turmeric root, turmeric fresh grated in everything, in tea, on toast, soups, every single made meal. She says it acts like an antibiotic and that antibiotics are becoming useless to us and we need to change back and maybe she's got a point about that or that. But she gargles it. She gargles turmeric. It is really hard to hide her illness when we go out because she's made herself so yellow. Good grief takes off a layer and it becomes a welcome map. 
Berlin. Do you know where George is, Auntie? Auntie, you know very well where George is, Berlin. No, no, no. No, I, I can't find him, Auntie. It's really tricky to get the turmeric paste under him and not all over him. Now, I'd never be able to read this if it were just all over him, Berlin. Hey, Georgie, turmeric, why? Why would you do that? Uh, not eat, Burley. Slide through. Don't pretend you don't know. It doesn't suit you, Burley. I can hear who you're really talking to in there, you know. Burley. In, in where? Auntie? Auntie, what have you done with George? Auntie. I'm not buying it, you know. Berlin. What do you mean? I don't understand, Auntie. Look. Berlin. I am looking. Good grief follows the trail of thought. Auntie, I didn't see the A before, just the B, but of course. B, A, E. B, A, E, system, airborne surveillance. Small wonder you feel like you have to struggle to even get a word in when they're sending the messages down the satellite fields. Feeds. Good grief, it's on thin ice. I've not been able to breathe, it's so tight, but I knew, I just knew George wasn't George. I just knew someone had infiltrated his head. I just didn't know why. B-A-E, covert operations. No one can touch them. They own the Queen. Berlin. You think George wrote B-A-E? It doesn't even look much like an E. Oh, oh, a little E, I suppose. Well, if you look at it, look at it this way, I suppose. You've opened Skype, haven't you, Burley? Huh? Good grief stands behind her all the way. Auntie, don't you ever break into my room again. You have crossed a line, Berlin Manderley, and quite frankly, I am sick of spelling it out for you. I don't care who you think your mother is. You and I are done. Auntie climbs back into her safe place. Now, I might keep reading because I'm aware of time. Okay. But I am also aware of time, so I wonder if I should keep reading. <laughs> um, let's, well, let's do a bit more, and then um, I've got a few questions for you um, that we can wrap up with. Copy that. Okay. Yeah, copy that. Well, what I might do is I will just skip this scene, which is I'll just describe it to you and we'll read the next bit scene. Um, she's trying to, she says, oh, I thought they were going to cancel because of the burning, you know, the fires, the exams. No, it's still going ahead tomorrow. There's a bee in her room and she's trying to save the bee and basically there's the the grief and, and her to try and save this bee and then she's like, oh, I had to chuck it out with my hot coffee and I don't know, I don't know if it survived. So there's a little bit about a bee in there in terms of how little control she has about what she can do. And I and I guess I'll just mention this little paragraph because it does tell you about um, subtext. She says, "I don't know. Uh, I don't know why my aunt says that." Uh, blah blah blah. And then she she's trying to focus back on studying, and she says, um, "The Amazon, the Amazon, fire graze, gas grow, fish water bits, toxic travel, air drop, methane degradable, brink heat stroke, stink extinction bits, grains blaze, cracked earth, mud swap flood bits." Floating cars, stranded packaging, animals, insecticides, soaking windows, dropping bats, rivers, rivers, bits, broken birds, landfill, whales, seeds, permafrost, burst, thirst, buried houses, busy bees, trees, motorway, rising sea level, surviving defrosted sightings of a dying bits, species, bits, teetering, nanoplastic, loss of natural habitat. You hear her aunt screaming off. Loss of natural habitat tries to put a headline on loss of natural habitat. So there's a bit in there about how much what we're actually going through with the world in terms of where we're headed environmentally is getting in the way of her studying. And then this bit, so the last bit I'll read out, uh, sectioned again, this is the bit where her aunt has been taken away, the police were called uh, by the family and she uh, was taken into a hospital. It's called Locked In, Locked Out. Berlin follows auntie. Good grief is behind. Oh, good. It says the stage direction again. One of these ones. Good grief is behind her all the way. <laughs> um, and so, so you've got to figure out for yourself what that means. It, well, the way we did it, yes, literally following her, but at a distance. Um, 
She says to Good Grief, seriously, do you just follow me everywhere? Good Grief is part of the family. I'm not signing you in, no. They're in hospital. They're at the front desk of hospital. Good Grief is undeterred. No, no, you don't. This is a visit between me and my auntie. Berlin searches for auntie. Exactly the same as last time. The two watching TV, someone talking loudly on the sofa, someone else shuffling. I still can't tell who the staff are. A glass window in an office with no staff in it. When the door opens, everyone rushes it. Oh, I, I can't see auntie. Auntie enters. Good grief is between them. Auntie. Hi, Berlin. Oh, scared me. Oh. Look, I would have brought you something, but I couldn't, Auntie. Are you going to get me out of here? Berlin, what? Your mum is about to walk in and she's not lifted a finger, so please tell me you're about to set the record straight, really. You've got to tell them who really owns George and where he's headed, Berlin. I found his skin. It's okay, Auntie Sill. He's just under the house. I, I would have brought it in. It's really cool, all the yellow scaly bits. You could hang it up in here, you know, something yellow on the wall, Auntie. Got to you too, didn't they? Berlin, I, I, I don't know what I don't know what you mean. I'm really sorry you're in here, Auntie. Auntie Burley. Sorry just doesn't cut it if you're not gonna lift a finger to sort out my basic human rights. I can't even see the doctor till Tuesday. This is a complete violation of every legal precedent sent up to exact justice, and I am smack bang in the middle of it. I would have thought you could appreciate that, being an animal kingdom carrier. Berlin, is it horrible in here, Auntie? There are sanitary pads under the bedposts, you decide. Berlin, oh, you don't believe me, says Auntie. No, 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 I just, Auntie, uh, can I at least show my niece my room to the staff? A staff member follows the two of them to her room, Berlin. It's okay, I just meant there are three sanitary pads propped under the bed's metal frame. Why are they there? Auntie, don't waste your time, Burley. Are you going to tell them the truth? Tell them who really owns George? Berlin doesn't know what to say to the staff. Auntie says, no, 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 I'm not about to go and sit down, excuse me, to Burley. She says, well, look at this one. She's about 12. This, oh, Burley, they're drugging me in here. I only have a small window left to the staff. I don't need water. I need a coffee. Berlin says, I, I can get you out to get a coffee, Auntie, if you're allowed. If I can speak to the doctor, but the doctor won't speak to me. He says, you have to give me permission. So I, Auntie, can go now. Berlin, but Auntie, leave. Berlin, Auntie, still, I'm trying. I really am. Auntie turns away. Good grief is open-armed, but cannot embrace. Berlin sees her mum. Mum? Berlin runs past good grief. So that's the scene where they are in the, she's visiting her while, when she's in second. And the, the provocation I was going to set about that, <laughs> but I do realise of the time. So I might just mention it's a good thing to, when you're practising the scenes, um, keep in mind the spatial relationships. In that one, you can't tell on the page very easily when I read it out, but it's completely dependent upon what Good Grief is doing between them that whole scene. So he's always between them. In fact, for COVID, it would work perfectly because he's like always two metres away from them. Um, so, you know, no matter what they do, Good Grief comes between them, which is what, you know, the point is. But um, I'll hand it over to you, Isla, because I know you said you had um, you had some questions. Great. Um, well, thanks for that, Sky. It's been really great to have um, a, some insight into how things like subtext work and, and um, to get some examples from you. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask you, first of all, about mental health, which obviously is a central theme of this play. Um, and you write a lot about mental health generally, I think. Um, I just wondered why you felt it was important to to incorporate that into this play for a young audience and um, and is, I suppose, is calling it the turmeric trail a way of kind of making that the central focus 
for the play as well. Yeah. What's the sense of the title? Yeah, that's really a good, that's a good question. The Turmeric Trail, you would see it so clearly on stage because it's a, um, literally a yellow trail that would be made while you're watching. But the auntie interprets the message. She's wrestling with a psychosis which affects her way of seeing reality. So she believes that there is a message and that George the Snake is somehow involved in this messaging and that, that there is quite clearly as the three letters being um, written with turmeric. The um, the other part of the turmeric just came from my own obsession with turmeric, where I was actually, and I still do it, I, I love freshly grated turmeric, but it does leave a stain, and I was just so intrigued by the fact that, you know, it just doesn't, it, it strikes, it, it, people often comment on how, you know, ooh, what's that on your fungals, you know, um, and I was thinking how <clears throat> little cues like that are often not easily integrated into what's considered appropriate, for example, uh, in public. And my fascination with, I always write made up stuff about the truth, if that makes sense, based on my own experience, as I think a lot of writers do. And my uh, family, there's lots of different uh, people who I love dearly wrestling with different variations of really debilitating um, m mental health wealth issues so it is very familiar territory to me um, but I didn't set out to write about psychosis necessarily it was that I think it just ends up being meshed in everything mental health I mean I think a lot of different um, wrestles with mental health you know converge on a lot of different things like environmental themes, um, exams, stress, growing up, etc. And what I find happens a lot in situations is it's not a simple cut, clear cut case of this is the situation in the family. There's, you know, there's other things going on in the family and other people's points of view in the family. And I am intrigued by that pressure or that because Another play I've written called Mishkoreki Goes Missing was about a nine-year-old who went missing to be noticed and part of that, the trajectory of that play was she wanted her permission note signed um, but there was a lot of stuff going on. The father had lost the job. The mother was on the couch a lot but, you know, she, the hint is that she's feeling really struggling with clinical depression and, um, and in that play uh, it's the... The, the convergence of those different things that's quite simply her trajectory she wants to go to ballet she wants to go to the she wants to go to the um excursion to russia bolshe ballet excursion russia and she does she gets in as the replacement so the, the opening line of that one is oh i got in i'm the replacement i'm the replacement but she needs special shoes and she needs her permission note signed and there's a lot of stuff she has to go through to try and get that done in her family because of the chaos um i think what happens in my experience is People read what they will from from those things based on their own experience with mental health. So, um, oh, there was a great a great line I read from Bernard Stiegler, this philosopher who had said yeah, he put himself in. He was in prison. He read all these books to get into uni to pass the test to get into uni, and he had said he believes that we simply reading is the act of interpreting text through your memories which struck me as a perfect explanation for why some people will see plausibility in some of these situations that, you know, I mean, some people, you know, may not, may say, I have, it said to me, no nine-year-old would go through that or this or that's not age appropriate. And, and I think it totally depends upon your own memories and your own idea of, of what's possible as to what you read possible. So I am intrigued by the different kind of, um, putting those different experience. I don't think there's that many things that talk about it as quite a normal experience, and I think it's actually normal for a lot of people. So, so when when people say, "Oh, you know, uh, oh, can we talk about that kind of thing?" I feel sadly it means a lot of people will, will be feeling like, "But this is just my reality. Why is that at all a hot potato?" <laughs> like, you know, there's yeah. no need to treat that any differently. And we yeah. don't do with other things like alcoholism or, you know, if you're writing about an aunt who moves in and who's drunk all the time, it has a very different reading on stage. So I do I do feel there's a lot of um, 
you know, silence around those things. Yeah. Great. Um, also just wondered, um, this was commissioned by Imaginate, um, which is an organisation that um, promotes theatre and dance for children and young people. Um, and you've also worked a lot with young writers and performers. Um, so just wondering if you could tell us a bit about your work with young playwrights in particular, and how do you help, how do you help people get started? Oh, okay. Uh, first thing to say is, I, I, I mean, I've worked with all sorts of young artists, whether they've had any experience in theatre or lots. Um, I haven't found a dearth of uh, things to, to write about. What I'm saying is the getting started part is simply a, a kind of like, all right, <laughs> you want to flesh out, you know. It's more that. I don't find that there's a lack of um, will to, uh, you know, there's always there's always a, a, a there's no shortage of things to say. That's really what I'm trying to say. Um, but, yes, I, I find there are, there are there's one thing I do actually, this is a very practical thing. It's more about writing spoken word and poetry often. But and, and I've done it with adults too. And and I tend to actually use the same um, you know, tasks working across all ages, except obviously, you know, four and five is a bit different and you need to, <laughs> you need to have a bit more fun with the other stuff too, which all feeds into it. But which I love, I love the age group. I also love eight to eleven. Um, I think it's because they have less of a sense of this issue of plausibility actually but um is you take an image you take an image and you just say okay i've got an image here okay um from the internet this is just an image you will find this i don't know the artist's name offhand but if you googled rooms with sand and you get it i think and i would just say okay so what is this as in describe what it is now, this is a real rushed way of saying it but let's work out what this is to you if you had to describe what it is in words. And now let's work out. Um, so you say it is a uh, door, sand, blah, blah. And then what it is like. And you might say it's like not being able to breathe. And then you combine the two by starting with I am a, I am a suffocating <laughs> uh doorway now that would be weird um but i often find that's the beauty of, the beauty of poetry is you can say things like that and you're cutting to the essence of something which you then have to yeah you do have to kind of interpret for yourself based on your own memories as to what i am a suff this is a bad example i'm a suffocating doorway i don't necessarily think i'd want to end up with that but i don't know i am a I don't know what it would be, but that is something that I start with, which um, gets you to try and mesh two things together, and then you expand on it. Okay, so I'm just conscious of time. Um, so I just wanted to ask if you had one top tip to give someone just starting out in writing for performance, what would it be? <laughs> Imagine you are the tardigrade <laughs> and simply start and then just don't give up. And then, <laughs> and then, no, turn up, I think, is the, you know, lots of writers talk about this and certainly where, where yeah, I would say start, try to sit on that little voice inside that might be trying to um, examine what you're writing as you're writing it. Um, start, continue, <laughs> and and enjoy it, <laughs> and have fun, and have fun somehow. Yeah, but if you have, if you have, you know, I guess there's something. If you've already come to that kind of, how would I start? You're already halfway there because you you've got something you want to say, and you're trying to work out how to stage it or how to form it. Um, Great. And are there? Um mentoring programs and and things like that that people can apply to if um if they're looking to for a route into to writing or performance yeah specifically for an age group or or um, well, specifically for young writers and performers yeah what kind of routes young writer performers yeah, yeah. so there's, 
that's something I'm very passionate about, um, which is what I why I'd set up the word of mouth at when I was at Toonspeak. I know there's a company that's just been set up, Sanctuary, which okay. is is specifically looking at, at LGBT and uh, and and other diverse other writers who identify as being diverse. I think there's loads of support with the Playwrights Studio if you look them up. Imagine it is a fantastic first port of call anyway because though they don't produce work, they are um, they have seen so many uh, wonderful things go out into the world and travel to see and have travel to see and are very 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 passionate about supporting different approaches. So you know, oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, even there, I think the Go See Fund which helps people go and see work literally or, you know, digitally it would be just at the minute. So they're, you know, I know I'm forgetting something. I'm forgetting something really obvious, but young writer performers, I mean, it's in, in Australia there's a company called Word Travels who I've worked with quite a bit who's, who's who set themselves up specifically for the reason that there is a huge gap uh, for those who write their own work and perform it and, and, and who are, We've got seconds left, haven't we, Ash? It's fun. <laughs> so, yeah, and Word Travels, look them up. Miles Merrill, who runs Word Travels, um, extremely talented spoken word artist and, and you know, ha has many, many different, um, have many different tips for, world, you know, internationally. I mean, he started with the slam movement. That was the... the Thing that he was focusing on. There's many different avenues with uh, writing, performing your own work. Great, thanks, Sky. I think sadly that's probably all we've got time for today. Um, but thank you so much for joining us and sharing some of your work and insights about uh, writing for performance. Um, you can find out more about Sky's amazing portfolio of work by checking out her website, which I think is just Sky lonergan.co.uk that's it yeah and there's another one called q poetics um poetry in, in cues i do poetry in cues um and Mio, I think there's a link is, is on there linked to my website great um okay so thanks everyone for joining us um and yes we hope to see you tomorrow for jews shield as well okay thank you everyone Bye. -bye. <laughs>